Hi, everyone. Good evening to those listening in from Japan. And uh, good day, I guess, from those friends and family from Germany. And good morning to all those friends and colleagues in the US listening in. Uh, let me share my screen and let's get right into it. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how robots perceive um, things, how robots perceive things visually, how they can see and recognize stuff. I should say that most of this is a joint work with uh, colleagues from uh, Freie Universität Berlin, namely Sunil Kumayarav and Erik Zimmermann. Let me first maybe tell you a little bit who's talking to you right now. So um, my name is Martin Skrotsky um, and Berlin gives you a clue as to where I'm from. I'm from Germany. Here you see Germany and this is where I'm from. It's a town in the west of Germany called Gelsenkirchen, really only known for its soccer team and uh, virtually nothing else. And I studied, well, a couple of kilometers away, about 50 kilometers away in Dortmund at Technical University in Dortmund, where I studied computer science and mathematics. Uh, after that, I was a little bit exhausted, so I took some time off. Well, not really. I went studying, but I went studying abroad at Texas A&M International University uh, down in Laredo, Texas, right at the Rio Grande, where I studied uh, mathematics again, and I uh, continued that at Freie Universität Berlin, where I got my master's in math and also stuck around to get a PhD in math. So most of what I'm going to tell you today is uh, from that time uh, getting my PhD and from some research we conducted afterwards. After the uh, PhD, I quickly jumped back to the States again to uh, Brown University for a quick postdoc. And currently I'm at uh, the Riken Research Institute in Wako, Saitama, Japan, where I'm for my second postdoc in the interdisciplinary theoretical and uh, experimental mathematics and sciences group. All right, so without further ado, let's get into today's uh, topic. And let me first tell you a little bit about the setup we are considering here. So what I'd like to look at in my talk is a factory. And our model factory will have certain products. Uh, these are the products and you see these are nice cubes and we will just stick with these cubes uh, for the talk as examples. So what happens at a conveyor belt like this in a factory? Well, at the end, there's usually some person doing quality control. So this person will uh, look at the product and see whether there's any damages or problems with it that might cause it to be tossed out here. Well, so People are costly, people are possibly getting tired at some point and might not pay attention to these products as well as they should. So in an ideal factory, really, we would have a robot that never gets tired and uh, always looks enthusiastically at all the products uh, running off from this conveyor belt. So how does the robot perceive our cube that's running off here? Um, one famous way to do this is via laser scanning. So the robot actually shoots a laser beam from his eye that's not going to hurt the product, no worries. It's going to be a very low energy laser. And this laser is going to be reflected from the product back to the robot. And this gives the robot a nice idea as to what he has in front of himself. Well, this is an optical measurement. So obviously the robot can only see what's right in front of him and he can't see this, this backside of the cube, right? So he might uh, need to turn the cube or walk to the other side of the cube and take another measurement, get another piece of the puzzle here and has to continue that maybe for the back plate or the, the bottom and uh, possibly get another shot from here. And now you see we have one, two, three, four, puzzle pieces and the robot can start internally puzzling these pieces together and uh, finally seeing this cube. So here again on the left hand side we have the actual product that our company makes. It's uh, green cubes and uh, the quality officer thinks it's okay, it's a good cube. So our robot has a problem because it doesn't see this nice um, cube on the left hand side. What it sees is like this bumpy 
cube that has a lot of little uh, creases and, and curves and caresses and edges and it's not as nice and smooth as uh, this left hand side one here. So where does this problem come from? For those of you who were old enough to um, have ever seen uh, this, um, that's basically going to one of these older TVs and going like in between the channels. And uh, what you see here is white noise. Uh, so some uh, radio signals that aren't uh, meaningful, that are just um, really being picked up by your, by your TV and um, being some, some yeah, noisy values. Uh, and, and we see the same thing here. So why here in the image you have some black and white dots here on your cube, you have some um, parts sticking out and some parts rather like being pushed into the cube. And this is a problem, right? Because um, this is basically a measurement error of our uh, robot. So the robot has the same problem that we have when measuring things. If you're given a ruler like this and uh, you only have certain tick marks on the ruler, you won't be able to really precisely measure anything in between those tick marks, right? So in the case of our robot, uh, the objects that we produce, our cubes, they might be glossy. So they reflect the laser light, the laser impulses that the robot uses to measure the object. They might reflect them and scatter them and uh, disparate them all over and the robot can't get a good measure on it. Uh, maybe when we produced the robot itself, we weren't really careful. So um, there's tool imperfections built into the robot. And so um, maybe the distance to the object isn't actually perceived accurately. There's environmental factors going into these measurements. So think of any company uh, factory you've been lately, um, if you've been, then you will know it's loud, it's noisy, it's, uh, it's uh, rough, um, it's uh, shaky, all these big machines going off. And so uh, there might be vibrations that uh, throw off our robot here. And finally, uh, the robot is a computer, so it has some limited storage and it might not be able to store all the data that it needs to the very finite precision that we need to actually recognize our product. So um, is everything lost? Uh, well, let's see um, what happens. So our products come out of the factory, our quality officer looks at them and thinks, yep, these are all perfect good cubes, they can go off for shipping. On the other conveyor belt, a robot looks at the stuff and, and he sees this really noisy and rough and not, ni not nice and smooth cubes and uh, decides to basically toss them all into the trash, which is obviously not what we want. So um, shouldn't we use robots now? Well, let's uh, see whether math can come in and uh, whether some mathematical model can help us here to uh, help the robot see or perceive things better. Let's look at this, uh, what, whatever the robots is seeing here. Um, and let's actually zoom in a little bit on this, on this top part. Um, actually, let's, let's, let's zoom in even further. And you see that these little bumps are basically sitting on a, on a plane that should be, should be very nice. So, so we should see this nice flat plane, but there's like little mountains and possibly little valleys that would need to be smoothed out. So if we, if we focus on this mountain right now, what we would need to do is just like push, push the top of the mountain down. And then we would have a nice flat plane and that would perfectly well describe what our cube looks like. So in terms of a mathematical model to do this, let's look at something we all know, um, heat flow, and let's, let's look at this short animation for this. So what you see here is a glass of, um, which has a little bit of water and uh, some ice cubes. And uh, over time, obviously the ice cubes are melting. So the heat distribution in this glass of uh, later water versus ice is going to change, right? You will have uh, very cold parts, the ice cubes. You will have very hot or warmer parts, rather, the water. But over time, everything sort of um, evens out and you have one even heat distribution in the glass. The same thing works for um, 
a heat source. So if we have like uh, some heat on a metal plate and we look like, okay, so this red means that these parts of the metal plate are really hot and yellow means they're not so hot. And when we wait a little bit, then we see that the heat dissipates into the medium and actually um, the medium heats up and these very hot parts become cooler. Um, don't be scared, just a little bit of math. So over time, T, we see that in all three, if we look at the three-dimensional equation, that in all three dimensions of space, X, Y, and Z, the heat dissipates. Uh, let's look at this uh, short, short movie just to, to give you another idea of what happens. So we start with a very uneven distribution of uh, heat here. And as time goes by, this quickly evens out and um, in your medium, the heat gets distributed very evenly. So that's something that we can all um, agree, right? If, if in summer we take a nice cold foot bath to cool ourselves down, then it doesn't take too long until the, the cool water is actually warm again and everything um, evens out. And we're gonna basically use this same principle here on our cube. So let's look at what that looks like. So we're gonna focus on this top part of the cube here, and it's shown here. And let's basically run the same mathematical model, but now on this, whatever it is that the robot perceives. And we can see um, that these bumps that we saw are nicely evening out, right? So, so over time, the model is able to actually create a nice and flat plane out of whatever the robot saw there. Cool, so basically we're done, right? Yeah, let's just check for the cube. So this is what the robot saw, right? This is uh, this bumpy and noisy cube. And let's run this algorithm that we came up with from physics and it looks nice. Wait, wait, something's going quite wrong there, right? First, it looks really nice. It, it's getting smoother and nicer, but then it doesn't stop, so somehow it, it almost goes all the way to become a ball. So what's happening here? Well, this physical model doesn't know that there's any such point as a point to stop at, which is the nice cube. So it just continues smoothing things, smoothing things even further, smoothing things out. And in particular, it smooths these corners of the cube out really fast, right? You see this artifacts here. This is just a bunch of points crammed together that come from the corner of the cube. So in the end, instead of the nice cube that we would want to have that we see here, what we do have is this ball basically in the middle. So what does that mean for our a robot on the conveyor belt? Well, we're standing there, the uh, products are coming in and the robot sees a ball and this is definitely not a cube. So again, things go to the trash. Uh, does that mean math has failed us? Um, maybe for this specific application, but yeah, let's see. We can probably find a workaround on this. For the workaround, let me introduce you to a concept really quick, a concept that we call normals, but that I would like to uh, I would like you to think of as, as spikes here because we're going to look at this hedgehog. And this hedgehog has like, I don't know, 5,000 spikes on his back. And you all know what happens when the hedgehog encounters an enemy. So the hedgehog curls up into a nice ball and he has all these spikes sticking out perpendicular to him. And they are all like pointing outward to fight off any enemy that tries to eat him in order to uh, stay safe. So we're going to basically use this very same idea. So we're going to take uh, the parts of our cube, the, the parts that our robot saw, and on each of these parts, what we're going to do is we're going to put such a spike and we're gonna have these spikes and we're gonna additionally to the parts of the cube that we had, we're also gonna start working with these spikes. All right, so what does that look like? So here we have the actual product and we have the actual normals or spikes that 
the product should have, right? So on top, they should all point upwards because it's a flat top. And then on this edge here, you will see them pointing off to the side because they can't decide whether they belong to the top or the side. And on the side, they should point off to the side again. And I guess you get the idea. So the robot has a slight problem with this because it doesn't know this nice underlying cube. So what it will see is not such a nice picture. So you see in particular here, they are all over the place, right? They're not in, in a nice line. They're like basically fanning out here. Also, this is nicely standing upright. This is a mess, a bamboo forest, but a mess. So maybe a first thing we should do is get from here to this picture and then we can deal um, with how to smooth our cube. So what we can do is we can do math, obviously, we can always do math and we can take uh, these uh, spikes or these normals and we can add some correcting term to them. And we can repeat this process, right? So we're gonna we're gonna take them and we're gonna add something that tries to correct them, and we're gonna do this over and over again. And I'm gonna show you in this quick video what this looked like. So um, you see that in the beginning it doesn't move as fast, but then quickly fast it decides on where these normals should actually go. And in particular, if you look up here, it's uh, really nicely pointing upwards after the iteration process. Also, you see that the cube itself that we can see here at the end is still not very smooth, right? It's still jaggedy, it's still noisy, it's still not nice, but the spikes are nice, right? So this is what we call like a multi-step method because in the first step, we didn't even touch the cube. We only touched its spikes. And now we're gonna get into the second step where we use this, the spike information to touch this cube and to improve this cube. So here we have a nice field of normals now, a nice field of spikes and these normals come from some mathematical equation where this symbol basically means that we can do things to infinite precision. So this is nice in mathematics, but doesn't really work for a robot because the robot, as I said, has only a finite memory field. So it can't really go into infinite precision. So we need to come up with something that is working with a finite precision. So we're only taking a finite things here, again on our normals and what we can derive is what mathematicians call an eigenvalue decomposition here. It's uh, really at this point not so important what these are. The main thing is that from this spikes, these normal fields, we can derive another quantity. And this quantity gives us a parameter that, and let me show you a picture because that will make things clear. This parameter measures whether we're on an edge or on a corner. Right, so this is a, a geometry, an object that has a lot of edges and corners and a lot of rather flat areas also. And you can see that this property here, which is if it's high is red, if it's low is white and it's rainbow colored in between. So on this line, it can't really decide. It, it is quite sure that this is not flat. It's not so sure whether it's an actual sharp crevasse or not. But on all the other creases here, you see it's really detecting them nicely and sharply, right? So this is what we want. This is what we want for our cube. We want to detect these corners. We want to detect those edges and we don't want to touch them. So yeah, we got a nice recipe, right? We're gonna take our cube, we already did improve its normal field. We already um, sorted out all these spikes. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, so as soon as these, um, this measure detects a certain value, it shall stop doing anything and um, still do the same process we did before, this uh, water cooling process. We should still do the same process on everything else, but keep those uh, high values untouched. And let me show you what happens. So you see how the algorithm quickly goes through. And as soon as it found very high values along these 
creases and along the edges, it just stops working with them and only smooths out the big planar parts. And this is exactly what we aim for, right? So our robot is still not able to actually see the cube. Our robot still sees this, but by internally processing it and by internally doing the math to even out these problems, he can derive that that should be a cube, what he's seeing, right? So now that our robot does this entire pipeline, the products start coming off. The robot thinks, oh, ah, I know this. This is a cube. And he can finally also uh, sort these as really nice and good products. End of story? Uh, well, not quite. Let me, let me direct you to one more problem we have. And that's a really tricky one. Namely, what I called here perfect quality control. And for this, I'm going to show you this bunny here. Right? This is the bunny that the robot sees from one side. That's why the ear is cut off. But so it, you see how it's, it's very structured. It's noisy. It has a lot of these bumps, right? And I'm going to show you another bunny. Is This is a bunny where we did apply our um, algorithm that we've derived so far. And we're going to continue applying this algorithm to this bunny. And we're going to end up with the next iteration and the next iteration and the next iteration and the next iteration. So this is difficult because what is the true rabbit? Which one of these is the actual bunny that we were after? There's really no way of knowing, right? And this is what we call in mathematics a ill-posed problem because we do have some noise on this bunny. This is not smooth, this is bumpy, but we don't know how smooth we have to make it in order to obtain the original bunny back. And so this is what we call the signal to noise problem. The signal is the bunny and the actual parts of the bunny that are sticking out. The noise is this bumpiness over here. And we don't know how much noise we have to reduce in order to obtain the actual bunny. And let me give you an example where this is extremely relevant. Let's assume we, we are in the not so far future where we actually do have cars that are out there self-driving, perceiving their environment. So this car is driving, it's regularly checking uh, its environment. So it sees this little hedgehog crossing the road here. And the question would be, is this actually something that's just a bump? Should the road be smooth? Then actually is the road empty? Or is this an actual object, right? So to what degree should the car smooth out the road? What should still be seen and what shouldn't? And that's an actual big, big ethical and research problem that we're facing right now. The whole thing today is a cautionary tale that I'm telling you. Um, we have only looked at cubes and obviously if I know that my factory is producing a cube, I can teach the robot way smarter things than this more general technique that I've uh, presented to you. If I'm having a car, then I have what we call time dependent information because the car is driving and it gets not one view of the street, but a continuous update on the street. So that is more information that can be taken into account. And obviously what I've shown you is a lower level method. It's based on first principles. So we only really work with the cube and maybe it spikes, but nothing else. So there's higher level methods uh, for this in mathematics, but they still suffer from this very general problem of signal to noise ratio. Obviously people are now very hyped of using machine learning for everything. And um, this is maybe not the best idea here because humans are, we are really great at learning. We can do things called one shot learning where we're shown something and we immediately know what it is. And we are visually just awesome. We, we recognize things so fast if we are, if we're shown them. And I think this meme really sums up the situation uh, that we're in right now. 
AI is just not at a point yet where we can trust it with anything um, that is not in a way heavily supervised. So as, as I said, it's a cautionary tale. Um, and hopefully now you know a little bit more about why we should be cautious because in particular of this signal to noise problem that we need to know what we're looking for before we can see it. So let me conclude here. Um, this noisy um, behavior is a problem in computer vision. We can remove it by anisotropic smoothing. This is basically the algorithm I've uh, talked you through. We have to keep in mind the signal to noise ratio. If we know what we're looking for, we can smooth for it. But if we don't really know what we're looking for, we might smooth too much and we can lose actual signals or we smooth not enough and we do still see noise in our data. Current research is basically uh, directed at making this more robust. So this noise signal to noise ratio problem is getting less severe and making it scale dependent so that even small levels of noise and also large levels of noise on the same object don't interfere with our algorithms. And with that, I would like to thank you so much. Here's some contact data if you want to spread this or learn more. And I'd like to thank you for your kind attention today.